Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week as we are doing today, and it is then posted on our Encompass Live website uh, for you to watch at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where you can access how all of our archive recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. For those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that is for all types of libraries. So you will find things on our show that are for <coughs> publics, academics, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, anything and any, everything that might be considered a library or library related. That's really our only criteria. That has something to do with libraries, um, the services and products we think libraries might be interested in, topics they might need to be discussing. Uh, we sometimes bring in guest speakers from outside of Nebraska, um, to, in, in Nebraska, from outside of the Nebraska Library Commission, I think I'll say, <laughs> to talk about cool things they're doing at their library libraries. Um, we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come in and talk about things that are specific to um, what we offer here um, in the state. Um, before we get into today's show, I want to do a brief um, chat about what we are doing here at the Nebraska Library Commission to help support our libraries in the state regarding the COVID-19 pandemic that we are still all in the full throes of. Um, on our Nebraska Library Commission website, we have a link here that is uh, pinned to the top of our page. It's always gonna be there at the top with links to resources. Um, we also have a list that we are attempting to keep up as much as we can of libraries that are open, that are closed, that are reopening, reclosing, whatever accommodations they're making, curbside pickup, Wi-Fi in the parking lot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you see, you know, this is just Nebraska libraries, so check and see if we've got the right information for you if you are from Nebraska. I'll just show you here is the post that we have where we also have some maps showing um, the library's situation regarding um, if they're open, um, where you can get free Wi-Fi um, in the parking lot and stuff like that. Uh, then here's our specific pandemic page, lots of resources depending on your situation. What do I do with my kids? What about unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. But I just wanna highlight quickly our page for libraries. We've been gathering information since this whole thing has started earlier this year, and we are updating this page regularly with resources, information, links to webinars that are coming up or recorded. Um, studies, information, whatever, from ALA, CDC, World Health Organization, IMLS, OCLC, all the library, anything and everything you think of um, that might be um, useful to libraries. So um, for our Nebraska libraries, we're trying to keep this up to date. So always check in here. You might find some new updated information um, on here. This is a page open to anybody. So if you're not from Nebraska, yes, please go ahead and take a look here. There may be some things here specific to what we're doing in Nebraska, but just pay attention to that. Um, also check in with your own state library or your state library association. They may be doing the same thing for you in your states. Let's get into today's show. Amanda, I'm going to hand over presenter to control to you so you can get your slides up. <clears throat> there we go. And today it is the last Wednesday of the month, so that means it is pretty sweet tech day. <laughs> um, <Yay>. Yeah, <laughs> with Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, we've set up with, as I said, the um, last Wednesday of the month um, to do for her to come on the show every month to talk about something techy related. Uh, we sometimes have other sessions that are tech related too, but gen definitely if you're into tech, this is the one that you want to be paying attention to and being here um, for. And today she's going to talk about technology versus human values, how to take control. I'm hoping that means the humans taking control, not the technology, but we'll find Fingers out. Crossed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just hand it over to you, Amanda. Um, go ahead, take it away. All right. Let me just pull this out of the way here. So the main reason I decided to, to, to do this topic right now is because there is a congressional hearing going on right now. Mm -hmm. And it is, I don't know if you've already heard about it, but there is a House Antitrust Committee going on that is inviting Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google to talk about 
technology monopolies and how they might be impacting people. And this is also kind of important for, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. And so this started going on. I started talking to a lot of people about it. And then I started quest getting questions about what can we really do about this? And are we just at the whims of technology companies or can we actually do something? And so I started talking to a bunch of different professors, a bunch of people that work in tech, and I started gathering information and resources and pretty much everything I could find. And it all boiled down to values. That was kind of the common thread that ran through everything was we're doing a congressional hearing to find out if company tech companies are right now fulfilling the values that they promised that they would fulfill and then the other part of it is it's not all just on the tech companies it's about how people use the technology that's going out because i don't know about you but half the time i don't use technology as it's intended we all adapt it we shape it we adjust it to meet our own needs. And then we find new and creative different ways to use the technology. And then it's dr drastically different than what was intended. So then we have to align our own values with the values of the company and the values of the other people that we're impacting with technology. And it kind of got to be a little bit of a heavy topic because when you ask someone, what are their values? there's kind of a deer in the headlights moment because I found out that not a lot of people get that get asked that very often. I know I don't. So this is more about how to find out what your values are without just asking what are your values because that doesn't really get very far and people don't really attend that session in the library. So let's get started with just one question, if you could put in the chat, what is the technology you use on a regular basis? Technology, what would be the definition? Like an actual tool, like a device or like software or? It's all technology. It can be YouTube, it can be social media, it can be your smartphone, it can be pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. And this is also kind of the other catch-22 of technology is it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. So really, and that's a good point is that before doing an exercise like this, maybe you want to add parameters to it. And maybe you want to start saying, what does technology mean to you? Mm. Yeah, so go ahead and type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, just start listening to what things do you use regularly if you ever thought about what made you choose that tool um particular device or interface and how you feel about that um gosh i use a lot of things yeah. um and this is also another thing is that we have a congressional hearing going on right now for the major tech companies i use all of them mm -hmm. but I never asked myself why and then I found out when I started asking myself this question I'll give you an example I have an Amazon Prime account mm -hmm. and I get a lot of my stuff shipped to me now oh yeah and so I use the example of Amazon Prime that's a technology I use frequently mm -hmm. and I chose it because one, I need to get supplies for crafting or for tech projects that I'm working on. And I like to order books and different things. And I send gifts out to people or I send things to my dad and brother in Wisconsin. And it was just easy to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I also use the Prime Video tool. But then I started digging deeper into it and I said, I started looking at how this technology impacts people along the supply chain. And I started saying, especially during the pandemic right now, because I was ordering different cords and things like that, but I wasn't ordering them all at once. 
I was ordering them just one at a time. So there would have to be a an actual person taking this to my doorstep. Every single oh time. Yeah. Every single time. Try to and then I realize, make it one delivery. Yeah. And I realize right now there was a period of time and it could still be true that their life is on the line because I needed a new USB cord to mini USB cord. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So it's how does that technology impact people in the real world? And I think um, that third question there, how do you feel, has changed. Yeah. Um, for some people, some people had always had issues with Amazon and their practices. And I know that people at Taco just don't want to order from them, find somewhere else. Mm -hmm. That's not an option for many people. Um, rural people I know, it's the only way to get certain things without having to drive three, four hours to where they can get their toilet paper or whatever. Um, so, you know, people had issues with them before, but now there's other issues to think about, like could somebody or somebody's loved one die because I needed yeah. whatever I ordered, but I needed the thing too. And I didn't want to go out and bring in anything that will, you know, make any of my loved ones ill. It's a whole, oh, it's so much. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it feels like too much to think about. <laughs> yeah. um, we have some comments coming in of people, what people use. <clears throat> Let's read off here. Um, social media in general, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter for marketing purposes. Uh, some use iPad and PC, uh, cell phone, laptop, smart TV, Alexa. Yep, we have Google Home at my house, Siri, smartwatch. Yeah. Um, there's things too, like you mentioned, I don't use Apple. We just never did Apple products, so I don't have anything there. Um, our family happens to be just the, like, goes to the Google and um, Android side. No. So one common thread I see through pretty much all that technology is privacy security. Mm -hmm. Has anyone considered what happens to your data when you go on a website, when you download an app, and when you use a free technology tool? And, and that's almost rhetorical because every person I've asked has wondered that before. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, well, what do you do about it? Yeah. So, and let me know if you can see this on your screen when I open it up here. Okay. But do you see YouTube's, yep. our mission is to give everyone a voice and show them the world? Yes, yep, that's a okay. yep. That's good. So YouTube posted their mission statement, and you probably already know that YouTube is owned by Google, and Google is under the parent company of Alphabet. Right. So YouTube's values are the freedom of expression, freedom of information, freedom of opportunity, which is that anyone can succeed on their own term, the freedom to belong to a community and gain support from other people, and a lot of these values will probably sound pretty familiar because we're librarians. Freedom of information, freedom mm -hmm. of expression, freedom of opportunity, freedom to belong. Sounds it's, like libraries. You could mm -hmm. ask any, pretty much any library and it would be the exact same thing. And, but then you, let me close this here and I'm gonna open up this chart. So this is used in um, for ethics studies and different stuff like that, but it's called an ethics matrix. So across the top, I put the different values and I just shorthanded them for the freedom of expression, information, opportunity, and to belong. And now we're going to go through the different attributes and features of YouTube and put them into different categories and say, is this good for people? Is it bad? A little bit of both? Or meh, could go either way. So did you know that the advertising revenue allocation for YouTube actually only goes to the top 1% of YouTubers and that the rest of the YouTubers don't actually see it? There, I, there are so many people that have YouTube channels now 
I'm kind of not surprised that <laughs> yeah. I mean, just, just the odds of how many everybody you know and anybody has what we have one as I mentioned before the show that's where our um recordings of our encompass live shows go and anything yeah. else we do video type um for the Nebraska Library Commission we do not monetize that of course that's yeah we're not profit but we are one of we are a YouTube user so in my mind I would put that under opportunity because YouTube claims that everyone has the same opportunity but it also only goes to that top one percent mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then cyberbullying this isn't just YouTube it's everywhere yeah but I would put that into belonging and put that into the bad category. It's a bad thing. Yeah. And influencers, um, I just went to an entrepreneurship program through a local university, and there was a girl that was trying to grow her brand, and most of her questions for the local expert were how to grow her influence. And there was a moment in time where the local expert was saying influence is not exactly what they sell it to you in media <laughs> and just because the number you have a certain number of followers doesn't mean that one you're influencing a good thing and two that also puts a different brand of stress on the person who has to curate their life for a youtube channel but Influencers also can encourage people to do awesome things within communities. And depending on how you use your influence, you can do some pretty awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's pop it into both. And I'll put that into, it can go into belonging or opportunity, but I'll put it in opportunity. So basically you would go through and you would classify each one of these different attributes into mm -hmm. one of these different categories. And I'll just do this really quickly. And just because I've done it a few times before and may as well. Mm -hmm. So storytelling, we're librarians, it's delightful. Absolutely. <laughs> the autoplay feature, they found out that it actually encourages people to spend more time than they normally would have on the platform, which is good for YouTube and good for ad generation, but not necessarily good for the people who are trying to get things done. I hate it. That's my personal yeah. opinion, but <laughs> I mean, it depends on the what's being autoplayed, I suppose. Yeah. So I'll put it under both because it can go both ways. Yeah. So basically, this is just a general classification thing. And then you would find out, you would look at the overall technology tool, put these into different slots, and then by the end of it, based upon your own community and your own interest, you would define whether this technology is supporting human values or it's not supporting human values. And you would do that based upon how it stacks up into good, bad, both, and neutral. And then you can also take that a step further and say, is there a way that I can change my behaviors and change the community that I'm surrounding myself with to use this tool in a better way? Because YouTube's not going anywhere, and I love YouTube. And I do believe that it actually can do amazing things. But there's also a downside. Oh, sure. And that's kind of what I found with pretty much every technology, including and especially the monetization, including YouTube Premium, which says, if you pay me money, I will stop showing you so many ads. Mm -hmm. And YouTube ads are what generates most of their income. So do we have any questions about how that ethics matrix works? Do you have any questions about anything that Amanda is sharing or talking about? Just our comments of your own, um, experiences of your own, just type right into that question section of your GoToWebinar interface. There's nothing right now, no. <laughs> I think you're right, all of the technology that we're mentioning, I, and I know some people do, I'm sure some people do have opinions of things being just outright 
blanket, you know, black and white evil or good. I don't, yeah, yeah there's too much, um, too much gray of all these technologies, the benefits that they have for some people and the bad things that they do. Yeah. And there's this one here, the psychometrics and data collection is the biggest question that I get. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I have some resources and some activities that you can do specifically for that. And so this is another version of the ethics matrix that puts the values and then court, like cordons them off to different target segments. So I use the target target segments that a lot of different libraries use, which is the mm -hmm. children, parents, teens, adults, and older adults. And then I've used this in community development scenarios before mm -hmm. that say communities are looking for different tools to do outreach and to ways to bring community to get together and connect people. But is the tool that we're about to choose and use going to do more harm than good? And how can we reach these different people and bring people up instead of just giving them another thing to do? So and with these attributes on here, you can say, we're looking at using this free to use tool. We wanna to avoid in video advertising and we wanna provide access to information without doing too much data collection. And then you can go through and say how these different values can align and you can encourage people to use the tool in an appropriate way. And you aren't asking people to do something that is going to do more harm. Right. So the biggest thing that this is riding on is if we want to be able to align the values of companies and use tools that will align with what we believe and what we want our community to be, we kind of need to know what our own values are. And that's kind of a harder question than I originally thought it was going to be. I started going around and asking people, I turned into the values girl. I never thought I was going to be, be, be that, but I started asking people what are their values, and I try to keep it as not touchy-feely as they possibly can, mm. <clears throat> but I started instead asking, there's an author who's called Nir Eyal, he's out of Stanford, and he did a whole bunch of research into technology values and human-computer interaction and user experience design, and he also does books on ethical design. Mm -hmm. But he said, instead of asking people what their, val like what their values are, start asking how you spend your time. And how you spend your time is usually what you value. Mm -hmm. So if you ask, what do you do? Do you like doing it or do you not like doing it? And then start putting a list of just characteristics in front of people and say, if you make a point of spending as much time with your kids at the end of the day as possible, your values are probably family orientedness. Mm -hmm. If you spend most of your time after work trying to learn a new skill, then your values are probably ambition. If you spend most of your time after work trying to develop relationships or go out into community building, your value is probably community building. And what do you strive to do in your work time? So it just kind of turns into that. And I'll put in a link to the book that this is based on at the end of this, because it was a pretty good one. Um, indistractable. I think, yeah, I think this is great. I'm. Um, <laughs> You've done previous shows, you've talked about values too. And I think a lot of people, me included, get deer in the headlights when you ask that. It's a very weighted question. What are your values? I'm like, I don't know. I know the things that I care about, the things that I like and don't like, but translating that into a value is where I, I kind of lose the, I don't know. I, I, I can tell you these kind of things. And then it'd be great, yes, to be able to then extrapolate from these basic things that I do know about myself, what that means. Right. that I can then use in the future, yeah. 
And the easiest one that I found is actually the book character. This one is a, actually a great one for kids. I used this one with my niece and nephew. And I asked if you could put in the chat, who is your favorite book character? And it can be any genre. And what are the characteristics of that character that made you say, yes, that is my character? My niece chose Wally because he does good things. Okay. But that Wally and from then, a movie? Yeah. <laughs> or was it a book first? I don't know. Um, it's actually both now. Okay, it's both now, yes. It's and good. so she got it from a little Disney book. Oh, okay, sure. And it was one of the little golden books, and she said, Wally! And I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. That's a great one to do, see what he would do about technology, yes. Yeah. Anybody and, want to share theirs and what you think your favorite book character might do with technology? Go ahead and type into the questions section. Um, and I'll give you an example of kind of where I'm going with this, so you kind of have a better idea of what I'm looking for. So the example that I used was a Lizzie Bennett from Jane Austen. Mm -hmm. sure. And mostly I just watched Pride and Prejudice before and I re and then I read the book again because why not? And it's because she has like a steadfast ability to just be herself. And she was willing to defy the norm of not striving toward marriage just so she could pursue her own identity. And then I started thinking, what would Lizzie Bennett do in modern times if she was confronted with all these tech companies that were out for data collection, getting money, and it was shaping who we are as people, individuals, and communities? What would Lizzie Bennett do? And then I started thinking about YouTube and I would start saying, well, if Lizzie Bennett had YouTube when in her time, she would have used it as like her megaphone to say what she wanted to do and what she wanted to be. And she would have carved out a space for herself and she would have been unapologetic about it. Mm -hmm. I could see that definitely. Yep. <laughs> So this is like a really good exercise to get people thinking about what are the human characteristics that people have? What have I observed in what I've read? And how can I start to emulate that person and their imagined use of technology in my own life? How can I rewrite my story to be more like the characters that I admire? Mm -hmm. And another great example, um, I read the Harry Dresden series from Jim Butcher. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, this is both a really good example and a really bad example because Harry Dresden is a wizard. And if he goes near a lot of technology, um, it kind of blows up. Um, like he was by a, he had to go like within a 40 foot radius of a, saw that they were using to remove a cast from another character's leg because if he had been too close to it it probably would have blown up or just kind of fused out mm. but her the characteristics of harry dresden are that he's really value oriented he says i don't always it's kind of a gray area sometimes what's good and bad but i have to do what is what I think is best based on the information that I have available. And he's gone against some of the toughest monsters and some of the toughest like demons and just horrible things. But he's prevailed because he's brought together community. He brought together people. He made, he built relationships and then he never, he treated people well. And because he treated people well, he was able to call upon people and bring people together every time something was fight, trying to fight the supernatural community of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And this was just, I was blown away by this. 
And I started reading this series years ago. But yeah. then when I started thinking more about technology, I was like, you know, if Harry Dresden could pick up a computer without like blowing it up. If he could, he would, yes. <laughs> um, you know. That's a whole separate issue, but yes. <laughs> right? You know. He would actually use it for to bring people together. Like he would use social media as like a outreach. And in the Harry Dresden series, they actually do that. They have like a person asking, I need help with this. And you know, I'm a good person who's done these things before for you. Help me figure out this thing. Right. And they use, um, they have the paranet. So the paranet is they started levering social media to be able to reach people. And it's kind of like their phone tree that will warn people whenever there's like some horrible danger to the town or they need to bring people together. So if you need to be able to reach a werewolf, a vampire, and a wizard, paranet. Hmm. <laughs> and it's kind of, they do use technology for good. They hmm. use it to support human values. And they're fighting people who are using technology for, to do terrible things. And they're fighting people who are building monopolies over technology. So when I ask, who is your favorite book character? What do they stand for? And how do you want to be more like them? And how would they use technology in that way? And you can feel free to put in a, any questions about how this process works. Mm -hmm. And if you want to have more examples about how this would lo look in an actual activity. And I've written out kind of the general guidelines for how to use this in the library, but that's just, it's a PDF document that's basically like setting up a workshop. And you can do it with pretty much any age group. Um, it works for, I, as I said, I've done it with my niece before. She is six years old. And I've done it with, uh, there are some young adults that were in a makerspace and I just kind of tried this impromptu just to test it out. Mm -hmm. And it worked pretty well. Yeah. And it all it's all about how you introduce it. Because if you introduce it and say, today we're gonna find out about values and technology, you know it's not gonna turn off. It's not gonna, yeah. It's <laughs> I probably should have titled this something different because I probably would have gotten more people. Yeah. But hindsight. <laughs> But the question is, what can you do to bring people in without calling values values? Mm. And if anyone has any ideas about that one, I would love to hear about it too. Send yeah. a chat, send an email, send a smoke signal, something. <laughs> yeah, let us know in the questions if you thought of anything about this or if you've got any ideas, any ways you've um, attempted to do this or that you thought of that could um, accomplish that, yeah. Like I said, I mean, we were talking about this, it is an intimidating phrasing to use. Um, and I think maybe making it more, less obvious like this, what's your favorite book character or what do you like to do? And then bringing that into, so this means you probably care about this and you care about that. And now you can tell people, oh, I care about this. This is the thing I am in about my community or about my family or whatever, if you haven't figured that out already. Yeah. And another one I've used is build your own story. You can be anyone you want, anywhere you want. You build your own characteristics. You define yourself. It doesn't matter what your current situation is, and it doesn't matter who you're surrounded with right now. Who would you be if you could? And then you write out that character profile, and then you are given different prompts that say, you have to bring different people together to be able to accomplish some spectacular task. Um, Harry Dresden, you'd be fighting a giant T-Rex, something like that. But, and then you can go through and say, how, what are the different tasks that you would go about? These are the technology tools that are available to you that can let you accomplish this goal. How are you gonna get there? And then they have to start thinking about it. And they have to start saying, 
well, I use social media all the time. I don't like doing this with it, but I really like doing this with it. And I think I could start shaping the use of this tool so that I can do it this way. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of a good exercise. It takes a little bit of um, setup just because of the, you have to put together little technology sheets so people know what you're talking about. And if you want access to some of those text sheets, I've got them. Um, I'm still putting, I'm still organizing my files for that one, but it's getting there. And so then once you've gotten people started thinking about this, like the first step of it is just Amanda, thinking. Do you want to make your slides full screen or were you going to jump oh, to the else? All right, I only, I put them out of full screen because I needed oh. to be able to interact with that one oh, slide, okay, sure. but I'll pop them back in. So the other big question is, okay, great. I've gotten people to be aware that values and, te and technology is a thing. You need to start thinking about it. We've gone through and we started writing our story. We've started thinking about our values. We looked at the values of tech companies. How do you put them together? Like, how do you bridge that gap between what I believe, what tech companies say they believe how tech companies actually do and do not fulfill those values, how do you line it all up? And the fun thing is that if you did one of those story narrative routes, you've already kind of started to do this because your basic goal is what did you say you were going to do? What did you actually do? Do you have the self-awareness to be able to say whether your action supported your value? And this is a thing. As I started doing this more and more, I discovered that people don't always think about how their actions stack up. And they write this amazing mission statement and then you get bogged down into the day-to-day -day, and then your actions are just survival. And that happens both in companies and in real life. Because I worked with some low-income communities too. I'm from a low-income community. And you don't think about values when you're, you don't always think about values in a low-income community. You say, okay, I need to be able to pay the bills. I don't have time to spend three months looking and vetting out for a really good quality job. I don't always have a job that's nearby that's going to align with my values. I'm doing this and I'm sucking it up because I need to make money. And that's what makes it difficult because survival on Maslow's hierarchy of needs will trump values any day of the week. And I get that. I've done that. Mm -hmm. But it's also, we've come to a point in time where we can't do that anymore. And that's why I look at economic development so much and I look at technology versus values. And I know that this is a really, 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 it's a long road ahead. But it's also, start asking people what would happen if you didn't ask at all? What would happen if you just let companies run rampant and just let that shape the world as it is right now? Let tech companies continue to bring in the top 1% of all money and then create educational programs and outreach programs that teach kids how to use technology tools in the way that they indicate, and then don't provide the educational opportunities for all these communities to teach this in their own way. Because if you think about it, Google right now is in an antitrust community hearing but I also, I have done this myself. 
I use Google's tools to teach people how to use digital literacy. I've used Google tools, I've encouraged Google tools to be used in classrooms. Kids and people of all ages get used to using these tools, YouTube especially, and then that just funnels more people to create more data that can be collected. And then we're not teaching people how to leverage the data for themselves. How many people do you know look at data analytics? Actually, we're in libraries, probably quite a few. So <laughs> bad example. <laughs> but in the community at large, how many people are looking at the data they generate and how it's being used for and against them? And I'll actually, I'll take a second to open up this digital literacy guidebook here. So in this guidebook, I put together a whole bunch of different resources about privacy and security online. And one of the things that I put together is how can your data be used and what is your digital footprint? So your digital footprint is what happens when you go online and when you click on stuff, you start generating a trail. And how can your data be used? I put together an infographic. And let me know if you can see that on the screen. Yep, yep, I can see it, looks good. So if you ever, if you ever have someone come into the library and say, okay, I'm starting to think about how all this tech stuff is impacting people. I really wanna know what happens to my information once I go online. You can use this. So these are all the different areas that are currently tracking you. Um, email, social media, websites. If anyone has a Fitbit or any different IOT device, all those Internet of Things devices, they have, it says Internet for a reason. It collects and stores data really similarly to the way the Internet does, but it can do it in wearables and anything on your person or in your household. Mm -hmm. And anytime you use a voice assistant, um, I actually did an exercise where I used my voice assistant for a week and then I opened up my stored data log that showed every single voice assistant usage. And then I saw a little blurb on there about how they automatically requested permission to use it to improve their product. And I said, okay, fine, it's free, I'll do it. But then I looked at where that actually goes once they improve the product. And then I looked at who can access the information once it's collected. And the biggest one that got me, advertisers, everyone knows about, but the biggest one that got me was data brokers. So if you've ever heard of a company called Axiom, they are one of the biggest data brokers in the world. And they scrape data that they purchase from other companies. They clean data and license it to various different organizations. So when you use your Fitbit now, Fitbit has different licensing policies, but it's not none of this is regulated. So you can also you purchase a different brand from a different company that doesn't have as much outward policy and there is no regulation that says they can't sell it to a health insurance company. Mm -hmm. And if a health insurance company starts using the information collected from your Fitbit, there's some stuff in there that you really don't want your health insurance company to know. And if they can be cleared to, if a health insurance company can be cleared to use the information collected to deny health insurance claims, and this is already a thing right now, what's going to happen to people and they weren't no one was told that their information can be used that way it's not in the fine print and the company doesn't have to say it's in the fine print because google and websites 
they don't know and they don't track how data brokers use and repackage the information. And data brokers can also clear like clear out information from public sources like any city government or any like gov like freely available government information and then they mash it all together and push it off for a profit when they also sell it to other government organizations but if you go to axiom's website you can see the different psychometric profiles and they collect over 10,000 different data points about people and they can use it in a lot of different ways. There's a reason that data is money, data is gold. And this will put another rhetorical question out there. How do companies make money? And how is it impacting people? And do the website owners actually know what happens to the data that they sell and let people collect? And everyone knows about hackers already. I mean, that's been a thing. It's going to be a thing. But some people don't know about the internet service providers. Um, AT&T and several other providers have gotten in trouble for selling their company, their data to data brokers. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, Ars Technica was the really good article that I read about that one. And it's just looking at the different avenues that your data goes through and using this to evaluate whether technology companies are supporting their own values. Because if we don't know that this exists, we can't use it as a metric to determine values. And this one is also helpful because once people learn about this, their next question is, how can I keep my information safe online? And so this is kind of a collection of different things that people can do. The biggest, most common one is use a strong password. And you can also use something like LastPass, which will store all of your passwords in a locally stored area. And you can read, I have in the privacy security section of the digital literacy guidebook information about how LastPass works and how their security process and encryption service actually works. And another thing that nobody ever does because they're phrased so interestingly is reading website policies mm -hmm. and where this information goes, what it does. And the thing is that all of this stuff the average person doesn't usually do because they're looking for some greater authority to be able to do it for them. Just tell me, I don't, I, I can't figure out to do how to do the research myself. Yeah. Which is understandable. And, it is a lot to, yeah. But incidentally, that's libraries. It's common sense media and it's, Informa libraries are an information warehouse now. If we can't tell people how to stay safe online and how to read website policies and be able to interpret them, how are we going to curate information properly? And I know that a lot of like libraries everywhere are already working on this. So that's something that we're aware of. But how do you bridge that gap between information to values to making an impact on the community? And that's what this is all about. All right, so I will close this here and go back into my slides. So what is the time looking like? It's 10.53 right now, so I'll just go over kind of a review of different ways that you can use this in the library that's a little bit more fun than the heavy stuff that we just talked about. So you can use this a lot in book group discussions. Um, a lot of libraries are already doing them and the only thing that you really have to adjust is the few of the questions that you started asking. 
So you might be able to ask one less question about the theme of the book and kind of start tying it over into how this relates to everyday life and how you can use this idealized version or dystopian version to adjust what you do in the real world. And you can also host dystopian novel themed events. So the biggest one is either 1984 or Fahrenheit 451. And 1984 is the utmost badness that could go on with technology. And if you don't want Big Brother to wa be watching, what can we do right now to shape our world so that that doesn't happen? And Honestly, that's probably the most successful one because dystopian novels are kind of everywhere right now and they're already yeah, thinking about so it. <laughs> yeah. And so some people don't get into books, but they really get into movies. So if you want, if you just do a group viewing of Hunger Games or there's there's quite a few out there but either dystopian novels, sci-fi movies, or just things that can be related back over to technology, either overtly or casually. Like Pride and Prejudice, you wouldn't normally think about technology, but it's also that kind of mashup that can start getting to think about different ways. And I already talked a little bit about the community development part of it, but start doing exercises for user experience. How do people interact with your community right now? And how do that, how can technology help or hurt that? And basically this would be, I don't know if how many people have done user experience studies before, but say that you wanted to promote the use of social media to learn about different events within the community and you want to find out which social media platform to use and which one is most effective. You would go through your different, choose one demographic and the biggest one is probably teens or adults who just graduated from college and you want to get them integrated into the community or reintegrated into the community. And you want to find out how is this demographic thinking and feeling before they start using this service? What makes them want to seek out different events and what makes them want to interact with their community? And then what is their experience while they're trying to search for this? Do they know that your community is currently on social media? And is the community on the same social media platforms as your demographic? And is this a frustrating or an exciting or an awesome experience for your demographic while they're interacting with the tools? Are you using engaging imagery that actually reaches that audience? And then after your demographic has used your social media tool or hasn't used your social media tool because they don't know it exists, how are they feeling in that moment? What are they experiencing? And what would make them interact with different tools? Is social media actually your best route? And there's a there's a book called Sprints that talks about how to kind of do a rapid fire approach to testing out new ideas and finding different ways to do things. Actually, I have it right here. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. But there's also other books out there that talk about user experience design and Harvard iLab also has an awesome video about that. So if anyone has any questions about that or wants to know more about it, then you can feel free to reach out to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I think it's important what you said about how in the library, that last part there, how are you in your library and your community using your technology? And you saw earlier when everybody enlisted so many different types of technology that they do use themselves, and it, it's all it's all over the place. There's so many. 
just because a technology exists and can do a thing doesn't mean it's the right one for your library or your community. Um, and what you use for yourself is going to be different than what you'll use in your library too. You've got to figure out what are my patrons using because that's where I need to be. Or what are my non-patrons that I want to be using the library? Are, where are they? Where are the people in my community using technology? Is there, you know, don't just put your stuff out there because you think it's good or you've used it personally. Do a little research and figure out and ask where are my actual people that I'm trying to talk to? And that's what I'm gonna use. Um, maybe in my library, in my community, for whatever reason, Instagram's just not a thing and that's fine. Just because it's big doesn't, a big thing doesn't mean it's your big thing. <laughs> Yeah. And it's also because we talk about how to reach people via social media. And then on the other side, we talk about, do you feel like dirt when you're using social media? <laughs> and it's like putting those two together. <laughs> A little depends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> little column A, little column B. <laughs> It's, but, it's, you know, it's, it's, you, you've got to be where your people are. And in some communities, the best way may be the local paper, yeah. Um, yeah. not technology flyers in the local stores and businesses in town. I mean, it, you're going to, you may have to do all of it too, not just the technology, but also all of the non-tech or low-tech versions. And incidentally, Canva is a tool that you can use to oh kind of spread your brand across all formats. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to use the same color scheme and the same layout for a printed brochure and a flyer and mm -hmm. a social media platform for Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and all the biggies, um, Canvas- You're recognizable, can yeah. Highly recommend Canva. It is yeah. easy to use. It's got a great free version too that you can do a lot with. Yeah, I use it a lot. It's what I used to make that infographic before. Yeah. And I've made like just a hand, like I think it's spilled out over a handful now of <laughs> infographics I've made. Yeah, but if you're not a graphic designer, you can you can pretend to be one by using it. <laughs> yeah. Or if you are a graphic designer and are just kind of low on time. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But do we have any questions about what I covered so far? Let's see. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and ask them. We are at 11.01 um, Central Time via my computer clock. But if you do, that doesn't mean we're going to get cut off or anything from the show. Um, if you do have any questions or comments or thoughts or anything you want to share or anything you want to ask of Amanda, um, we'll get through all of them. Um, no, no problems at all. So go ahead and type in any questions you may have. Uh, nobody had anything during the show while you were talking, and that's fine. You know, you may be just absorbing all of this. You know, like I said at the beginning, values are, it's a big word. It's a small word with a lot of, yeah. And I put in the link to the slides if anyone's interested in looking at it. And yep, I'll yep, be updating yep. that with a few things once I've I'll add in that book that I talked about, a link to that book from Nir Eyal, and I mm -hmm. really hope I'm pronouncing that right. I can spell it. <laughs> and I'll add in a couple other things in there. And if you want to borrow that, uh, this values matrix, you can also grab that off of the slides there too. Mm -hmm. And this blank one that goes by demographic is also on there. But it's it's super easy to just make your own table too. It takes like two seconds. Yeah. And all I did was just take the values that are stated on the company's website. And then I took the actions that they did in the version, in the format of the features that they added to their technology tools, and then layer them out into the good, bad, and the ugly. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'll also and mention too, while we're talking about, you know, if you put the slide, the link to the slides in there, if you don't grab that, when the recording is ready for this and available, I'll have a link directly to her slide, to Amanda's slides as well. So um, you'll be able to get to it there if you don't get it out of the uh, GoToWebinar right now. Not a problem. And the digital literacy guide is linked in the last side down here. 
So if yeah, you want to check that out, um, there's pretty much every major category under the sun, and I'm adding new stuff to it all the time. Mm -hmm. The online privacy security is probably the one I get the most questions about because it's mm. kind of a thing right now. And I mean, it's always been a thing, but now that so many of us are online so much more because of um, the pandemic um, or even entirely online, as I think some people who are just, as you said earlier, eh, it is what it is, are now thinking, maybe I should think about it more now that it's where I have to do almost everything. Is it something I should be like paying more attention to? Yeah. Yeah. And for those of you who know, this is, as you can see, it's on our Nebraska Library Commission website, um, but it's for anybody. It's not like behind anything or passwords or anything. It just happens to be our you know, Amanda Technology Innovation Librarian here in Nebraska has put it together. Um, but you're welcome from anywhere to go and check it out and use it. And if you want an infographic that you can use to describe. Yeah, these technology. are great. Yes. Then this goes through the major categories and it's just like the 30 second blurb about what it is and why it matters. Mm -hmm. So if you need nice to take it over. That you can hand out. And I'm pretty sure that I linked this somewhere in here, but I'll also put it into, I'm pretty sure I linked it into the overview. But let me, I'll upload it to my Google Drive and I can, oh, Google, there I go again. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> yeah. But then I can link it over to the slideshow that I put in there. Okay, yeah. But if no one has any questions, that's about that's the long and the short of it. Yeah, awesome. Um, this is a great se session. Thank you so much, Amanda. A lot of things to think about, I think. This is the kind of topic I think, like you said, we're asking all those questions of yourself that people need to take back um, to their own homes or libraries and think about it and maybe start having discussions with other staff to see what are we as a library doing about these kind of things and these values. Let's think about it and do some uh, facilitating of it maybe. Um, I think the resources and everything on here are awesome. Thank you. Yeah, all right. So I am going to get this out of my way. There we go. Pull back presenter control to my screen. Uh, Did you? There we go. Yes, yes, awesome. All right. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. As I said, we'll have the, um, the shows being recorded. Should be ready by the end of this week at the latest. I will email everyone who um, attended today and everyone who registered for today's show to let you know when the recording is available and when um, the slides are up there for it. I'm going to go back to our main Encompass Live page here. Um, this has our upcoming shows, but right underneath them is where you, can, you will find the link to our archives. Uh, this will be our full archives here. Most recent show is at the top of the list, so today's will be there um, sometime tomorrow or the next day. Um, depends on how, how quickly you uh, go to webinar and YouTube cooperate with me <laughs> as I'm doing it. And this is one for last week. We had a couple of different links, but there'll be a link to the recording for today's show and a link to the uh, slides. Um, that have all the other link links within it. So that will be there. While I'm here on the archive page, I will show you there is a search feature. If you want to search any of our previous shows, you can search the full archives if you want to, or just most recent 12 months. Um, that is because this is our full archives. I'm not going to scroll all the way down, but um, Encompass Live premiered in January 2009. And all of our shows going all the way back to then, which is over 10 years, are here on this long, long page. <laughs> um, so if you want to find just recent info, uh, limit it to most recent 12 months. Some of our shows will stand the test of time, you know, reading lists, things that are internal. But some things may be, some topics may become outdated. Uh, links may no longer work. Websites might no longer work. Uh, services and products may have changed completely or disappeared. Um, but just pay attention to the original broadcast date. You always have a date here so you know when it, well, that show originally was done so you can you know get an idea of, okay, this one is actually a couple of years old, so maybe I need to find something more recent. Or maybe I'll just check it out and see you know, if it's, you know, good for um, what I needed or good for historical purposes. Uh, we are librarians here, and this is, this is something we do. We archive for historic, for history um, things, and we will always keep our archives up here, the full archives, but just pay attention when you are searching in there. 
Um, but we do also have a Facebook page. If you like to use Facebook, this you can give us a like over there. Speaking of technology that people use for different reasons, <laughs> um, this is where you can keep track of us. I post reminders. Here's a reminder to log into today's show, uh, a little intro to our speaker, um, when the recordings are available already, I post up on here. Um, so if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like there and you'll keep up with that, that with us there. We also do use other social media here at the Library Commission, Twitter, Instagram, and we do have a hashtag, if you notice in our slides, NCUMP Live, that is for all of our NCUMP is Live shows. Um, I also created one for our Pretty Sweet Tech, if you want to talk, you know, focus on looking up stuff about that as well. So elsewhere in social media, you can use those um, hashtags to find posts we've done. So uh, that is what, um, for today. I hope you join us next week. Our, our, our coming shows are here. I am in talks with a couple of people for more August and September dates, so keep an eye on the schedule for when those get finalized and added. But next week, we are going to be talking about grants, money. The Kreutz Bennett Donor Advised Fund is our grants specifically in Nebraska for Nebraska public libraries in um, communities with populations of 3,000 or less. So this is uh, grants for our small rural public library. So if you are one of those libraries, this is the show for you. Sign up for it. Find out about these grants. They are open right now for applications and um, find out how you can get some of this money for your little library in Nebraska. Other than that, that wraps up for today. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Amanda, for being here with me again. We will see you next month. <laughs> Uh, the next last Wednesday of the month. Um, and hopefully we'll see some of you uh, another time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.